Andre walks over to me, shirtless, his big and wild. I put a pillow on the floor. You know what to do, I say. He sits between my legs and hands me a jar of Uh huh. I grab his hair and pull him closer before I use the to scratch his scalp. He, <laughs> <laughs> he sighs and puts his hand on my knees. The more I work the the more he purrs. Oh, God. When I finish, he falls asleep. Hi, I'm Bim Adewunmi. And I'm Nicole Perkins. And, and this, this is Thirst Aid, Aid Kit. We're both writers and cultural critics, and we're here to talk about thirst. <sighs> so, Bim, hey, what exactly is thirst? Can you break that down for us? I can try. We're all very familiar, I think, with lust, Mm -hmm. desire, Mm -hmm. and in my language, fancying someone, Mm -hmm. that's a state of being, okay? You lust after someone, you desire someone. For me, thirst is the performance of that desire, of that lust. Mm -hmm. This is like an expression. I'd agree with that. Yeah? Yeah. We're just like, hey, these are people that we find attractive for these reasons, and it's okay to find them attractive for those reasons. And we're going to examine those reasons and why, you know, that attraction formed. I think, personally, Mm -hmm. that not enough women talk about their lust. Like, a lot of women keep it under wraps because whether or not they've been told explicitly to. Right. You know, it's like mm, good girls don't. Right. Right. But good girls do. Right. Very well. Very well. (laughs) (laughs) What for you is the best manifestation of thirst? Because for me, it has to be something that is explicit. For me, um, I guess right now it would be sending out some kind of raunchy (laughs) tweets every now and then. It's safer for me as a writer, I think, to write it down and then I don't have to look at anybody (laughs) in the face when I send that kind of stuff out. It's just like, hey, here's my thought and you can do with it what you will. I know that you also feel this way, but I'm going to be the one to say it. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. So So the kinship thing is important because we've been friends online for a few years now. Right. And I think one of the things that made me kind of sit up and take notice was kind of like, oh, she's filthy in the same way I am. (laughs) Yes. She thinks the same thing about the same guy. Yes. And speaking of that, Nicole, Mm. I did some digging. And when I went digging, I was rewarded over and over again. I was like, oh, my God, Nicole is disgusting. Oh, my God. And I love her. So here is one from June 2015. Okay. It's basically a tweet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with four photos of the Danish actor Mass Mikkelsen. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is what you tweeted. You said, and I quote, I bet part of his foreplay is keeping his mouth right above yours as he demands you tell him what you want him to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my thirstiest tweets. I I really like him a lot. Do you? I do. It doesn't show, you know. It feels very lukewarm. <laughs> this is from December 24th, 2010. 2010? 2010. Oh, my God. Bim says, and I quote, We're about to watch Star Trek. Again. I'm excited to see John Cho. Finally, it feels Christmassy. In my pants. <laughs> And then she has a little smiley face, not just an emoji, but actually like a colon dash and then a closed parenthesis. Like she took the time to make the smiley face. Well, let's go back to another, another beautiful tweet of just pure thirst. Okay. Like I read it and I felt parched myself, like secondhand parched. Okay. And this is from April 2016. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've quoted another tweet. Mm -hmm. And in that original tweet is a photo of the actor Mike Coulter. Oh, my God. (laughs) This tweet haunts me. Like, people talk to me about this tweet, like, every quarter. I feel like it's a perfect illustration of what thirst (laughs) is. And for many people, it should be the standard that people should be aspiring to. Okay. Um, so it's Mike Coulter, who is the actor who plays Luke Cage on right. Marvel's Luke Cage. Right. And you said, and I quote, <clears throat> I bet he mashes his cornbread in his greens, eats it with his fingers, then looks at you like you next. <laughs> Isn't that the most disgusting thing oh you've ever God. written? <laughs> 
I'm just so happy you wrote that. Thank you. It's <laughs> because it's so accurate. He has this very wide back that's just like perfect if you like he's at the kitchen sink washing the dishes <laughs> and you come up behind him and you put your face in his back in the middle of his back and wrap your arms around him like oh thank you for doing the dishes precisely that's exactly I, I immediately thought to myself i have several dirty dishes that yes. you could wash yes and then to extend that a little bit further maybe afterwards he'd pick up the baby Oh, and the baby of course could you burp. have babies. I mean, yes. wouldn't you make a baby? Yes. Right. And then he just kind of pushed, he put the baby up on his shoulder, mm -hmm, his broad, mm -hmm. right. broad shoulder. Broad shoulder. And burp the baby very gently. Yeah. And then put the baby down to sleep. Yeah. And then eventually, obviously, put you to sleep as well. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Speaking of Mike Coulter, did you know? That he was from South Carolina? I did not know that, actually. Well, now you do. Yes, now I do. And it's funny because our first episode is all about Southern Bays. Yes. And <laughs> I'm from Tennessee, and my Southern identity is very important to me. I bring it up all the time. I mean, I could tell that from your Twitter name. Yes, right? <laughs> my Tennessee whiskey woman. I think one of the things that helps my um, portrayal of thirst and that helps me craft these really naughty tweets is is being southern right i'm a very much uh from a tradition of storytellers right southern storytellers and stuff and so we have these really great expressions and we tend to be really hyperbolic and mm -hmm. extra with our compliments which and helps stuff. And thus, yeah absolutely yeah. so there's always <laughs> somebody that's like you know he's out here looking like a plate of yams right <laughs> like that's just amazing <laughs> cuz you know like it's a like a big healthy serving of yams it's sweet and good and, and when you're eating yams you know that it's it's going to stick to your ribs so i think the thing that comes up for me in my tweets a lot is sopping like be taking a biscuit and sopping somebody up or <laughs> pretending like they're a biscuit and sopping them up and i i went so back so essentially the the first object in this case must be kind of liquid based Right, yeah, it becomes just something that I just have to like, you know, take my biscuit, my Sponge roll, it yeah, and just like <laughs> get it wet and then oh. just. I mean, that's what happens when you sop something oh, up. Just the way you said it, get it wet. I mean, hey, this is all a part of thirsting. Oh, literally, because the yes. only way to slake your thirst is to get it wet. So, yeah, exactly. You know. Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So do you see this part of yourself ever reflected in popular culture ever? Well, as a black Southern woman, I find depictions of black Southern people to be cartoonish mm -hmm. on television and in film a lot. Um, but two television shows I really enjoy are Greenleaf, which takes place in um, Memphis. Love Greenleaf. It's a great show. And I really like it because it's a good mix of country and Southern. And there is a difference. And also <laughs> cosmopolitan mm -hmm. because Memphis is a major city. And um, it's, it's pretty diverse when it comes to classes and things like that. So I feel like Greenleaf does a really good job of showing those depictions across class lines. Mm -hmm. I really like that. And then Atlanta, um, Donald, Donald Glover's Glover show, mm -hmm. because of the way that it has all this, all these different portrayals of Southern men. And it gets into this, you know, heart of Southern rap. And you kind of see where someone like an Andre 3000 would come from in Atlanta, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how he has this very thick Southern accent, but also has a kind of, you know, polished approach to the way that he raps and the way that, um, the way Atlanta informs his music. I can tell that you have a lot, <laughs> a lot more to say about Andre 3000, which is fair because we all have a lot to say and think about him. I mean, I do. I do. I will always have a lot to say about <laughs> Andre 3000. And um, so to continue this conversation, I called up my good friend Cynthia back home in Nashville in her office where she works in public health. This is Cynthia. Cynthia, this is Nicole. Hi, Miss Perkins. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Wait, wait. You're calling her at work? Um, are you able to talk and curse and all that kind of good stuff right now? I can, yes. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. It's like she works at BuzzFeed. <laughs> and why did you call her exactly? Well, I needed some help unpacking today's thirst object. Mm. Andre 3000, Three Stacks, Cupid, Valentino, <sighs> Possum, Aloysius Jenkins. Oh, let's let's yes. discuss. Like, what is it about him? What makes him so damn sexy? Like, what, what, what? You know, Outcast was the first 
rap or hip hop group that meant something to me because they sounded familiar. First of all, I think it's just the Southern drawl and the way they talk and the way mm-hmm. that Southern men make music out of words. Mm-hmm. You know, even when they're just, hey, baby girl, how you doing? You yes. know, like stuff like <laughs> Stuff like that again. What? Huh? What, what was that? You know, mm-hmm. so it, it they have that thing down. Um, and then from there, he just transformed in all the ways that, you know, worked with us as we grew up and got older. And there were certain lines he said along the way yes. that, you know, got us in our chest and in our crotch a little bit. So yes. <laughs> what, like, line, what you, line in particular stands out? What do you think? I mean, there, there, there have been lots, but the favorite that always comes to mind is, you know, <laughs> I do suck lips till hips jerk. <laughs> yes, let's talk about that because that is one of my favorite lines too. From so fresh and so clean. I think for, and maybe this is like music as a whole. I think women could listen to music at one point and. You know, there was a little begging and pleading and baby, baby, and maybe not in hip hop, but mm-hmm. certainly in the R&B and the soul music that influenced it, you know, mm-hmm. or at least influenced what I look at as like Southern rap or Southern hip hop. So, you know, there were elements of that and then it went away. And then next thing you know, they were telling you what kind of hole you had to be and right. how you needed to dress. And, you know, they have strong opinions now about things like pubic hair. And I'm like... You ain't got no pussy. It's not your. <laughs> it's not up to you. You get what you get that day, sir. So like <laughs> these days, when a dude <laughs> or an artist is like, "Girl, this is what I want to do to you. I want to start here, and then I want to do this," but then he's saying it with such pride and so creatively. I want to suck your lips until your hips start. We know what that means, right? And that then- means he hitting it right. He not just sticking his tongue out and wiggling his face a little bit like there you go he's he's been there he's he's <laughs> yes. fully invested yes. what was that he, line he said he likes women in old school regular draws like he ain't he exactly. ain't fancy he just wants exactly. you he's just he just wants you i love a gentleman who's not complicated it's like woman listen i want you yes have you come that day i ain't worried about them panties you know what i'm saying right we don't need them no way but <laughs> Get right down to yes. it. Yes, I want to. You oh, said yeah. something about him saying something that's kind of simple and stuff. And for me, that's epitomized in "Where Are My Panties?" The interlude on um, the love below, because he Absolutely. says the way he says "booty." He's like, you know, he's like, he just want to lay on her booty, and it's cute, but it's also filthy. It's also like you can see that nigga just like telling you to turn over because he wants to use your booty as his pillow. Maybe I just roll over and just lay on her booty. Mm-hmm. I just, I just, I love that so much. And I, I've been with men out from outside of the South, and I would say that Southern men have really good dirty talk, and not even super filthy, but just what they know how to get right on your ear in the exact position you need them to be on your ear, and whatever mm-hmm. it is that they're saying, it just, it. It just makes everything you need to happen happen. <laughs> it just, it, I mean, the, the the accent, what they're saying, because again, they have this thing where they can say something real, real sweet, and it just the accent makes it sound filthy and nasty and delicious and juicy, and you just want it to keep going. But what if she's the? What if she? What if she's? What if she's the one? Um. Yes. <laughs> You know, it's it's when they start talking and you just screw your face up, you know, so you're almost frowning at them like, ooh, mm, mm, mm." like you can't, there are no words, you're just grunting and making faces at a certain point. And that's how I know (laughs) that the dirty talk is effective, you Mm -hmm. know, it just, that language becomes its own rhythm and thing, you know, and I think we know how to punctuate and build up because, you know, just general stereotype of South versus North, you know, we're supposed to be slower and all this other stuff, you know, and many other things that often get on my nerves. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, okay, if we're thinking about heat and grass and space, you know, it's like, why rush when you can take your time? Right. 
you mentioned uh, Southern men and their compliments and stuff like that. And I think one of my favorite things when uh, Southern men compliment legs, I'm like, girl, look at you and them big old legs. And it's just so girl, pretty. And it's like brown stallion horse with skates on. Listen, you know? <laughs> they love calling us some um, horses, thoroughbreds. All of this. <laughs> Bless them. What are some I, of the, I ain't even um, going to, I'm not worried about that today. <laughs> I know what you mean, brother. Mm, right. I do, you know. And, like, those were the earliest compliments we got when we were younger. And, and being able to hear that as you're coming of age, it just leaves these little, you know, mental notes for you. Oh, these things are acceptable. So y'all seen a, you know, sister stomping hard around the corner with the legs greased up, you know, mm-hmm. a particular time away with the short skirt on. And it's like, yes, yeah, sis, you better walk. <laughs> <laughs> Come through, you know, you better come around that corner strong on them. Let them know you ain't playing. So, you know, to know that um, and be able to acknowledge that we're taking in each other and taking in each other's bodies in that way is exciting because it just creates this sense that all bodies are welcome, you know. Right. Even though, you know, I've dealt with, you know, body image issues or whatever, it's always just like I know that when I go home, somebody's going to appreciate what I look like. And that even though, you know, we're not still supposed to, focus on outsiders in our bodies. It's still nice to like go home and see somebody look at me like I'm the most beautiful thing in the world. And that's what I get from Southern men a lot. Always, you know, it's just like that moment when you're on the edge about it and you're tripping. It's somebody that's like, wait a minute, are you trying to lose some weight? Don't do that. It's like, wait, now listen, Mm -hmm. we're talking about blood pressure right now. (laughs) (laughs) Keep from getting diabetes now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not self-conscious about the thickness. I'm just trying to keep my health together. Because chronic disease is is a terrible thing that is preventable. Mm -hmm. Anyway. um, (laughs) Yes, come on, public health. I'm sorry. sorry. (laughs) Just being me. to have anything you know turn you on it just means that it's making you be present with who you are and what you want and mm-hmm. that's always ultimately a good thing you know and that truth telling being plain speaking being honest being raw being nasty like all of that is essential and I think we get told along the process that those are things we're not supposed to hold on to and keep or we're supposed to box that up and hide that away in some capacity but I just don't want to live that kind of life. You know, I want it all out there. Like, this is all of who I am. Mm -mm -mm. Cynthia is obviously a preacher in her her spare time. I just... Oh, I want to meet her. She sounds amazing. She is. She's actually denying the call right now to be a preacher. But that's another story that Cynthia maybe will one day come on and talk about. But yes, that is my really good friend back home in Nashville, Cynthia Harris, everybody. For you, Bim, Mm -hmm. um, as a pop culture expert from outside of these wonderful states that are slowly crumbling I mean, wonderful, sure. Um, (laughs) (laughs) What did you learn about Southern men through all the various media portrayals that you've come across? I will say not very much at all. There's a shorthand to when you are representing the South in, in, in popular culture. So in Hollywood and in music, I suppose. So... I think when I think about southernness, I think about <laughs> I think about like ceiling fans and mint juleps <laughs> on the patio mm. or the veranda, as it were. Mm. And I think of um, men wearing white linen suits and racism and, <laughs> and mm. uh, yeah. but things like Mississippi burning, that right. sort of thing, Rosewood um, and all right, that. right, right, right. I'm thinking about deliverance. I'm thinking about Ugh. another trope, which is of this southern gentleman. You know, he talks very slow. I keep thinking about T.I. actually, who mm. uses a very <laughs> complex language mm-hmm. where, you know, why use one word where 17 will do? Right. I guess the short t- the shorthand for all of this is old fashioned. Right. Right. And yeah. that's something that I think Hollywood does over and over again, or at least has done. And obviously that's changing. You know, you already mentioned Greenleaf mm-hmm. and Atlanta. But I think for the longest time, a lot of that was just absent. And I think also that part of that, I mean, we'll come to this, I'm sure. But a lot of that also comes down to, to race. 
Right. I think a lot of people think of the South and then they think of Foghorn Leghorn, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, the rooster with this big brash kind of, I say, I say, you know, exactly. that kind of exactly. ridiculousness. So let's go back to what you said about the Southern gentleman. I want to kind of get into that a little more. Mm-hmm. So the Southern gentleman is supposed to be very, you know, sweet and charming and chivalrous. Chivalrous is a big thing with the big, Southern. Big, big. Yeah. That gets kind of into some toxic masculinity. 100%. But, we, but you know, we're going to keep it light. We're going to keep it. We're gonna keep <laughs> Let's <laughs> not keep it light. Let's keep it hella fucking heavy. Let's talk about how masculinity fucks with everything good. Wow. But <sighs> let's not also because it's very yes. stressful. I'm yes. Just, <laughs> I, do, I do think a lot, though, about the Southern gentleman mm-hmm. as this kind of exaggerated you know, masculine man who yeah. who does, you know, he's not he's not a fop, but mm-hmm. he dresses well. Right. So one of my favorite jokes from this TV show called Heart of Dixie that is about four years old now, I think. I don't I can't remember. But anyway, so it's about this uh, New York woman, Zoe, who comes to Alabama. And one day she has a guest visiting her um, from New York as well. And he's trying to figure out what's going on with this particular southern gentleman in the town. And he asks her, is he Southern or is he gay? And it's become, and it's, it really touched me because a lot of times people will ask me that about somebody. Is he gay or is he Southern? Because, as you mentioned, Southern men, particularly of, of a certain class, like to dress very well. I'm not even going to put a class on it. All Southern men, <laughs> I'm just going to make the, that big generalization. They dress really, really well. And not only if they, if they don't have the means to dress, you know, however whatever kind of way they take very good care of their clothes and they're meticulous they're the kind they're they're kind of fussy (laughs) yes they're the men who will fold their clothes before they start you know getting down to the bedroom stuff okay (laughs) so um so if you just hold that thought babe i'm just gonna gonna fold my shirt yeah that's okay (laughs) you know they're gonna let me line my shoes up so whatever whatever um so there's that idea that a man that takes care of his clothes, you know, has to be effeminate some kind of way. And sure. then they're also very into um, they're peacocks. They like to look good. They wear these bright colors. There, There is that. But then there's also this idea that he will be the one to fix your car, no matter how much of uh, how, you know, flamboyant he may be. He's the one that, oh, there's something wrong with my car. He's going to take care of that for you, whether he's doing it himself or he's Mm -hmm. going to get somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that stayed with me as I've traveled outside of the South and I've had relationships with men who are not Southern. I miss that. I miss, you know, the the man taking care of certain things so that I don't have to, particularly car related. (laughs) Um, But it's so specific. Well, yeah, because. Date a mechanic, Nicole. Well, (laughs) yes. If they didn't have gunk under their nails all the time. (laughs) You are so fussy. Oh, my God. (laughs) So I want someone who can fix my car, but also his nails must be perfect. Thank you so much. Apply within. Bye. Exactly. (laughs) A lot of what you were saying about Southern men actually was reminding me a lot about what people say about Nigerian men Mm -hmm. um, and Yoruba men Mm -hmm. and how they are, you know, you use the word peacocks and that comes up a lot. And, you know, they care about fashion. One of my um, uncles, uh, God rest his soul, was a man who was known sometimes would go shopping and would wear his new shoes home because he loved <laughs> he loved the idea of looking meticulous and looking. That always makes me smile when I think about him. But I think about so many Yoruba men who are very much kind of like, no, I won't let the dust, you know, touch me. Yeah. I won't let, you know, you're not going to fuss up, you know, you're, you're going to fuck up my look. Um, and I always find that really interesting because these are also the most masculine men on earth. But then they also want to look nice. Right. <laughs> and I really so, love that. I have this theory that uh, hyper-masculinity folds back into the feminine. 100%. I and, agree. And I think that these men epitomize that mm-hmm. um, a lot of times with just their appearance and, and the, how they want to dress and take care right. of themselves. And I think that also kind of lends itself to Hollywood uh, mockery, mm. which is why Southern people, Southern men specifically on screen, are seen as slightly effeminate but also like clearly very smart and blah 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 so i think there's like a because southernness as a as a marker is so wide Mm -hmm. you can really populate it with any kind of characteristics that you want to and some of those characteristics characteristics get replicated over and over and over again so when i think about how hollywood has not really made an effort for me to fancy southern men Mm -hmm. because of the portrayals that we've been given i think oh that's a shame because you know, there are lots of I think about I think the most famous the, the currently the most famous Southern drawl mm-hmm. is Matthew McConaughey's. 
and he does all right. the all right, all right, all right. Yeah. And he's very he's very specific. But I also thought to myself, he he kind of exaggerates it, right? Right. But yeah. also, but also, it's very very effective and when he doesn't do when he doesn't do it to like you know the nth degree when it's just there as like right. his accent i actually find it quite attractive like it's a nice and also he has a deep voice so it helps and he's kind of throaty and that helps also but i also think the ways in which we have become familiar with southerners are not necessarily authentic you know and that affects who we fancy and why right. don't we fancy more why aren't there more southern pinups because we've been told that, you know, they play banjos and kill people in the <laughs> woods. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I found that the idolized version of a Southern man is actually a Western cowboy mm -hmm. or a Midwestern cowboy. It's mm -hmm. not somebody from the South. And Matthew McConaughey, he's from Texas. Mm -hmm. And Texas has like this weird kind of thing about being considered the South. Um, so these ideas of a Southern man get kind of blurred. So people want the Western, Midwestern cowboy kind of guy. They don't want the Raylan Givens guy um, and that character from Justify. He's, oh he's from uh, Eastern I Kentucky. I love Raylan. I so, love I me mean, some Raylan it, Givens. It helps. <laughs> It helps that he comes in the form of Timothy Oliphant. Right. Who has perhaps the weirdest, sexiest walk I have ever seen. Oh and I my just gosh. I just want I want to cling to him like a spider monkey. I just fancy him so much. Raylan um Timothy oh. Oliphant's Raylan Givens accent is one of the best southern accents I've heard. All you boys can do now is make things worse for yourselves. If I were you. I drop my gun, lay down on my tummy, and put my hands behind my head. You would, huh? I would if I were you. If I were him, I'd just work on reading that little book without having to move my lips. Mm. <laughs> Raylan Giddens. Timothy Boy, Oliver. howdy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love me some Raylan Givens, Listen, boy. Listen, hold on, hold on. I have to get this out. I am so... Just hearing him just now, my stomach is doing flips. <laughs> oh, my God. I fancy him wow. so much. Timothy Oliphant is actually from California, I think. He is. He is. I did a profile on him, and yes. I was also surprised to learn he was from California. Yes, but he really captures a Southern, um, a particular type of Southern accent in Eastern Kentucky, where Justify, the TV show, is based. And it's really good because it's not this overly round... Um, thing like we I keep bringing up Gone with the Wind because it seems like that's what mm -hmm. you know people are using where it's like oh fiddle dee dee you know for mm -hmm. the women and then the men are just like well I can't believe we've got the you know it's that's not it you're a conceited black-hearted vomit red butt and I don't know why I let you come and see me <laughs> I'll tell you why Scarlett because I'm the only man over 16 and under 60 who's around to show you a good time but Timothy Oliphant does Raylan with kind of like He's got pressure in the back of his throat a little bit. <laughs> and, like, he um, knows how to bite his teeth together. Sure does. To, like, grit some stuff out. Sure does. And, I mean, he's just, and he knows when to talk fast and when to talk slow. Yes, he does. The su Southern people are not all speaking slow as molasses. Everybody wants to, you know, always use molasses as the cliche to mm -hmm. compare. First of all, hardly anybody uses molasses anymore, number one. And number two, there are plenty of fast talkers in the South. And Raylan Givens, as a character, knows when to talk fast, when to talk slow. You know, something like True Blood. It's, it had to, like, True Blood. What's <laughs> they set the course back 500 oh years? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I love True Blood, the first the four. Fir yeah, the first four, three. Three, Let's be honest. yeah. First yeah. three seasons of True Blood were Perfect. amazing. Yeah, I could overlook the accent because the accents because the men were good looking, and I I love vampires and werewolves and all that kind of shit. So it was great, but their accents were terrible. If one of you killed another one of you defending one of us, you don't think there would be a trial? I'll come with you then. No. I can, and I'm going to. I, I want to testify for you. Damn it, so you can't. You can't come, and you can't testify. It was really. So good. <laughs> it was so insulting. Bill, Bill. Particularly from Louisiana. Louisiana right. accents are a strange kind of thing, in particular where they're supposed to be from near Shreveport. And Shreveport accents aren't as, I don't know, luscious as a New Orleans accent. Um, but anyway, so like all these different things, again, it just kind of plays into this idea that people just think of Southern accents or Southernness as this one thing that's spread across, you know, however many states you consider, you know, are in the South. So in terms of then thinking about um, 
what pop culture is presented as, you know, a Southern woman. Mm -hmm. How does that affect you? Because I imagine people have expectations of you. Absolutely. So what is what is that like for you as a Southern woman? I found that in while I'm doing the whole online dating thing uh -huh. and, you know, we're chatting a little bit and the guy's like, so, you know, because I put it on there that I'm a Southern girl or whatever in my bio. And so then we're chatting and the guy is like, oh, so you have a Southern accent. I love a Southern accent. So I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Like, do, do people respond uh, positively or negatively to the idea of you having a Southern accent? Well, here's the thing. They have an idea of what a Southern woman is supposed to sound like, which sounds like a Southern belle, which sounds like <laughs> Scarlett O'Hara, <laughs> which is a very uh, specific white woman kind of sound. Uh -huh. And that is not what I have. Um, I don't sound like a Southern Belle. I actually don't like the term Southern Belle. Uh -huh. And so I think when people try to make me into a Southern Belle just because I'm from the South, I reject that and I resent it. So when people approach me and they think that I'm going to have this Friday Night Lights or Nashville, Connie, Britain kind of accent, I don't have that. <laughs> but when I get with my friends, it comes out, it gets really thick. And there's certain words that I can't say, like... <sighs> okay. The name K I M, right? Yeah. I can't say that word. I can't say that say, name. Say it. Let me hear you. No. Please say <laughs> it's it. It's going to come out in three syllables some kind oh, of way. Oh, no, please say it then. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> no. do you, do you, does that, is that a problem for BIM as well? <laughs> no, I can say BIM. BIM, BIM, BIM. I can say BIM. Okay. But, but it's, it's the letter K that fucks you up? I guess so. <laughs> So we've come to a very, very important part of the show. I'm excited. I, you should be, fam. You should be. Because this is, drum roll, please, uh, Fanfic Wars. Every week, we are going to write a short, a one-shot, a drabble, a self-insert, which is essentially a Mary Sue, if you will. And every single bit of fanfic that we write is going to feature our first object, of the week. Mm. This week, we have the uh, untouchable, the excellent, the amazing Andre 3000. Oh, my goodness. I'm I ready. know. I'm ready. I, I mean, God. It was very difficult for me not to just write, you know, basic erotica before I kind of pulled myself back. And I was oh, like, I totally wrote some <laughs> smut. But, you know, then I cleaned it up a little bit. All right. Well, we appreciate your efforts. So Nicole will read hers. Uh, and then I will read mine. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, dear listeners, you get to do the most important job of all, which is vote on which your favorite one is. And of course, they're going to vote for me. I mean, that's entirely wrong, but I like your confidence. Well, you know, I think we just got to give them a chance to hear how great mine is. And then they'll maybe pity vote for you. But oh, I don't know. Wow. I don't know. Oh I, my God. I think they're just going to go with their heart and vote for me. All this time, I thought you were my friend, but you're actually a bitch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> When it comes to Andre 3000, yes. I need wow. him all to myself. I need to win. All right. Well, If I can't win him in real life, then uh -huh. I have to win him in fiction. I'm so sad that you're going to lose him on both counts because <sighs> this week uh, I absolutely am going to win. I'm going to start first with my Andre 3000 drabble, and it is called The Getaway. Andre wanted to have a few weeks of peace away from city noises I'm not a fan of roughing it, so we compromised on this little country cabin with a washing machine, but no dryer. We've been here about 10 days, so I did our first batch of laundry and hung it out to dry. Dre went to the closest small town to get a few more groceries. He'd been gone a little over an hour, and the sun was starting to set when I decided to go outside and take the clothes off the line. The burning oranges and grapefruit pinks of the sky take their time, preening as they blend into a fiery coral, a color that reminds me how good my baby looks when he goes bright and floral. Andre. His hands slip over my hips as he quietly moves behind me, his soft smile finding its home in the bend of my neck. He tells me I smell good. It's the sun on the laundry, I say, and he turns me to face him, his face serious, his eyes shining. No, he says, his hands curving around me. It's the sun on you. He kisses me, and it feels like that glowing orb in the sky sends its last bit of warmth into us as we sink into the grass, the city far away, our skin whispering heat between us. 
Okay. Okay. Some heat, yeah? Yeah. All, All right. right. All the heat. Mine has no heat whatsoever. Um, I don't have a title for, for this particular uh, piece of work, this, this work of literature that I spent some time crafting. So I apologize in advance. So here it is. Um, we'll make up a title afterwards. Um, okay. So here goes. <clears throat> Let me drink some water. <laughs> I'm so thirsty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so what is it we're making today? I asked, staring at Andre's back from my perch on the kitchen counter. It had only been a month since we'd started seeing one another. I'd bumped into him at the bar after an Atlanta Braves game and spilled my beer down his back. He shushed my apologies with an easy grin and told me the only way he'd forgive me was if I told him my name. In the four weeks since that night, he'd taken me on a culinary tour of the South, all from the comfort of his apartment or mine, and I'd never eaten so decadently in my life. He turned around to flash me his knee-weakening smile, and I fixated on the cute mole right next to his nose. Andre's face was almost too pretty, a solid jaw, twinkling eyes, a nose that made me sigh, and those full lips that were currently quirked and tilted up at the corners. He sauntered over, placing his hands on either side of my hips and stood between my now slightly spread knees. I, he raised his eyebrows pointedly, am fixing you buttermilk biscuits from scratch. He wrinkled his nose and put on a phony posh accent, or as you call them, scones. I rolled my eyes playfully at him before settling my arms around his neck. I breathed him in, utterly relaxed and content to be bracketing his hips with my thighs. There might come a time in the future when I tired of being with him this way, but it was not today. Okay, you're making me scones, like a British grandma at a village fete. Oh, baby, he said languidly in his distinctive drawl. His voice dropped an octave and took on a raspy edge that made my breath hitch. I don't do anything like a grandma does. His lips nuzzled my throat and I threw my head back, laughing. Yes, Bill! <laughs> Yes, okay. Thank you. Flexing those fanfic muscles. Yeah. Okay, people. Now we've got Andre um, hang, helping me hang some laundry, take down some laundry. We've got him in the kitchen with Bim. But you know you want to see Andre out in the sun no, and the you grass. Do. You want to see him making food for you. You want to see him lovingly mixing some shit in a bowl. You want to see him bracketing your body on the kitchen counter. And I think you know what to do, which is to vote for my story. Right. Thank vote you. for Nicole. Vote for Nicole because my story, you know, was a little, you know, it was hot, dare I say. You could vote for Nicole as long as you spell it B-I-M and oh, then vote man. for that. That's kind of so. fucked up. Is it? Yeah. No, I'm here. I came here to win. I didn't come here to make friends, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> I came here to win. I came here to slave, bitch. <laughs> Get on Twitter and vote. Then send us your own Andre 3000 Drabble, which is very short, or it could be a Drabble by anybody Southern, but your Drabble is going to be a paragraph, four to five sentences. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so send your Drabbles to thirst8kit at buzzfeed.com and maybe we'll read our favorite ones on the show. And we'll also post our own Drabbles on our Tumblr, which is thirst8kitpodcast.tumblr.com. So, yay! That oh was our first podcast episode. I cannot believe it. This is the first one. It's out there. It's alive. Yeah, it's you go. Done. <laughs> it's out in the wild now. It is. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for just even trusting that we could bring uh, the appropriate level of thirst into your life. And just thank you for allowing us to give you a little bit of what I hope was joy in these times yes shall we say in, in these times <laughs> yeah and it's important that you know you enjoyed it and if you did enjoy if you did like what you heard then please uh we're gonna do a beggy uh, a little beggy segment now but if you could please please head to apple podcasts and rate and review the show it'll really really help it'll help other people find it discover it and love it as much as you do so please do that. And we'd love to hear what you thought of the first episode. So please send us an email at thirstaidkit at buzzfeed.com. Thirst Aid Kit is produced by Eleanor Kagan, Julia Furlan, and Agarinesh Ashagre with additional editing by Meg Kramer. Our music is by Tanya Morgan. You can find me on Twitter at Bim Adieu, which is B-I-M-A-D-E-W. And you can find me on Twitter at Tennessee Whiskey Woman. That is T-N, whiskey with an E, and woman. Uh, and in the meantime... Uh, what will you be doing before next week's episode? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm going to drink some pineapple juice and uh, just kind of uh, slowly watch the, the clock tick down for the next episode. Well, I'm not going to say what I'm going to do, <laughs> but I hope that our <laughs> listeners have subscribed yeah. um, everywhere that they get their favorite podcasts and that they keep tuning in every week, every Thursday to get more Thursday Kit. I think you mean every Thursday. Yeah, excuse me. We'll see you next Thursday. And remember to lust out loud. <laughs> You can't say it without putting, like, it's... Say, say it? No. <laughs> Please say it. Please say it, Nicole. Okay. I can't say it. <laughs> it's Bojangles. It's, it's Bojangles. It's so savage. And they have, like, the best sweet tea ever. Oh, my God. See, I would say Bojangles, but you kind of deepened the A-N and it became yeah. Bojangles. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck? Like, at that point, I was like, oh, shit, Nicole is Southern. <laughs>